1950 England was a different time. A denser time. A heavier time. A car with no safety equipment seemed reasonable, or at least relatively safe, considering that everyone was very recently getting shot at by the Germans. Automotive engineering had yet to consider not only crash safety, but serviceability, manufacturing tolerances, sound deadening, a host of other fields that we take for granted nowadays when we complain about things like 2mm differences and panel gaps. But it turns out you can make a car without all of those considerations, and it is better in some ways. Significantly worse in almost all ways, but better in some. When I started looking for a car for an electric swap, I wanted to get something that if it were in a cartoon, it would be the villain's car. Think Cruella de Vil or Who Framed Roger Rabbit, long hood, separate fenders, flat glass everywhere. I found this one in a metal building in the middle of California. It had been sitting in the same spot since 1993. The owner added it to his collection and then died nine years later. 18 years after that, his wife died, leaving the car collection to the kids who were selling off most of it. It's really hard to find a car in this condition that's this old. Usually it's either been already restored, sometimes poorly, or it's a rusty pile of shit that you can't do anything with. So I was pretty stoked to find this one. The body's mostly straight, it's mostly basic surface rust, nothing too bad. The car was protected by a substantial layer of 28 year old dust. Also spider webs. So many spider webs. I suppose you could call it a barn find, but it wasn't in a barn, it was in a metal building, but most barns these days are just metal buildings, so... Barn find is a term that's used pretty loosely these days by people trying to squeeze extra money out of their rusty piles of junk. I'm just gonna call it a shed find, because that sounds more British. Unloading the car was fun. It doesn't have any functional brakes, and the parking brake didn't seem to do anything. To get it off the trailer, I had to use the winch on the front of my Forerunner, run it under the Forerunner, under the trailer, around the back of the trailer, back forward under the jag, and hook it to the front of the frame. I used that to pull the car backwards off the trailer. Then I also used another small winch chained to the front of the trailer to keep the car from rolling backwards and through the back wall of my garage. <laughs> I'll be honest that I've never really been into Jaguars. I don't really know much about them, and I don't usually find them to be good-looking cars. I don't understand why people think the E-Type is attractive. It's okay, I guess, but I think it kind of looks like a tongue. Yeah, that's right. I said it. They do have some good-looking stuff. I think the current F-Type looks amazing. Their old D-Type race cars are great, and the XK120, which is the only other car they built in 1950, looks pretty good, especially in the hardtop. I also like this one, the long flowing fenders, the tall chrome grill, the wheel spats. It's such a good design that it even looks good in this awful color. But I didn't know much about it, so it was a fun adventure looking around. Like, these panels here? What are they for? Are they access panels for electrical stuff? Are they holding fluid reservoirs? No, they're air vents. Neat. Where's the spare tire? Well, it's hidden behind the license plate. The whole bumper area folds down to reveal a pocket for the spare tire. The trunk opens down, which is a weird choice, but it does contain a toolkit in the trunk door. Mine has most of the tools, but they're somewhere else right now. The fuel line comes out of the fuel tank and travels through the fender well with no protection, just getting hit by rocks, and if you have a blowout in your right rear tire, you might also have a car fire. Look at these taillights. Look at these tiny, tiny taillights, mere inches off the ground. I'm definitely going to need to augment these somehow. The battery used to go right here, but I had to cut out all of this because at some point the battery leaked acid, which ate right through the metal and into the car and through the floor of the car. So that's all going to get replaced. No seat belts, not even a lap belt in the front. Also, no side mirrors. Usually on a car like this, you'd have at least one side mirror up on the fender. I have a car with fender mounted mirrors. They look cool, but are not very helpful. And I'm sure on this car with the fender so far away, it would be basically worthless. The frame is made by stitch welding two pieces together. There's a weld every few inches, and water has definitely made its way inside here. I was hoping to bolt through the bottom of the frame to hold the battery in, but that might not be a great idea with this seam here. The welds don't seem to be super great, and I removed several tabs just by bending them with some pliers. I'm hoping this is a welding issue and not a material strength issue, but I suspect it's probably both. The frame is so dirty. There's so much dirt crammed in every crevice of this thing. Whole empty pockets of the frame are just jam filled with dirt. It's like this car was driven on roads made entirely of dirt. 
These cars originally came with this sort of ropey material between the fenders and the frame. I'm sure there's a name for this stuff. This car has most of it still on it, but it's really fragile and torn up in most places. <laughs> All the fasteners are some weird British thing. These quarter inch bolts had 26 threads per inch, which I had never seen before. Apparently it's a fine thread variant of the Whitworth standard. That's annoying because this car is now gonna have metric fasteners on all the powertrain stuff, imperial fasteners on the front suspension and a few other things, and this Whitworth thing for the rest of the car. Also, the fasteners, not well made. A lot of them don't fit a standard wrench. You have to use an adjustable wrench. Presumably in the 50s, all the wrenches were a bit sloppy to make up for the fact that all the bolts were a bit sloppy. There are lots of castle nuts. This is kind of a pain in the ass because the nuts are caked in grease and dirt and the cotter pins are sort of rusted in place. Nothing is super accessible. Uh, there's a lot of pliers and hammers and band-aids involved. There's also a lot of jam nuts. I guess nylocks and deformed thread nuts didn't exist yet. Also, annoyingly, there are no threaded bosses. Most of the bolts have nuts on the other side, which means you need two people to remove half of the bolts. Some of them are these captured square nuts, but the bolts are so rusty that you have to use so much torque that it just moves the tabs out of the way, and then the nut just spins. I'd use a cutoff wheel on several bolts. This is actually super cool. The car comes with an electric starter, but it also has one of those old timey crank handle things. This also won't be very useful for me, but it's pretty neat. The wiring, not great, but that was expected. Old Lucas wiring has a pretty poor reputation from what I've heard. I don't really care because I'm gonna rewire the whole thing, but I do love this fuse block. It looks super cool. I might just leave it here. I started taking apart the rear, knowing that I wouldn't need the spare tire pocket that was too small or a fuel tank. The rear uses leaf springs, which is pretty common, but the dampers are rotary dampers, which is not common at all. Also neat. This is really great. This is the workshop manual for the Jaguar. It not only tells you how to work on the car, but also how to disassemble everything, including these great pictures of all the fastener locations. It even shows things like how the rear dampers work. The technology of cars has changed a lot in the past 70 years, but so has the manufacturer's approach to maintenance and repair. While this 2020 Tesla is using special fasteners to prevent me from even getting into the high voltage battery, the 1950 Jaguar has detailed instructions on how to fix and rebuild every part of the car. I kind of get it. The automotive world is a lot more complicated than it was seven decades ago and in some ways more dangerous, but for people like me who are going to take it apart anyway, this book is priceless. I'm pretty impressed with the front suspension design in this car. Upper and lower control arms, strut rod, torsion spring, tubular damper. This could be on a car that was designed 50 years later. I don't know if the kinematics are any good and the steering is not great, but it's definitely a cool design for the time. Not cool enough for me to keep, so it's coming off, although I am going to use the existing mounts for my new suspension. The rear leaf springs are greased, and to keep the grease in there, wrap them in leather. You can add more grease by using these two nipples at the top. Neat. The interior is mostly in one piece, but will crumble if you look at it wrong. The seats are super fragile. Most of the wood is in relatively decent shape, at least good enough for me to use as a template to make new wood pieces. The headliner looks good, but I'm sure will also crumble at the first sight of a stiff breeze. It has a sunroof that slides back, or I think it's supposed to, it doesn't really work. It would be cool to put an electric actuator on it and make it powered. So far, everything on this car is so heavy. The radiator is 40 pounds. 40 pounds of old copper that I can probably sell at the scrapyard to buy a lot of meth. The starter motor is 20 pounds. My brain has a hard time processing this because I'm sure it should weigh half of what it does. I'm not even sure what's in this thing that could make it that heavy. Here's an interesting thing. The Tesla Model 3 drive unit is about 200 pounds. I believe the motor is about a third of that. So the drive motor I'm putting into this car only weighs about three times more than the starter motor that I'm taking out of the car. Most of the car is steel, but the drum brakes are made from the core of a neutron star. I don't even wanna know how much this steering column and rack weighs. I'm replacing almost all of this stuff, so I might be able to add a thousand pounds of battery and still end up with a lower curb weight. As you can see, it's already starting to come apart. I need to get the body off of the frame so I can weld up mounts for the battery and the Tesla subframe. It also needs to get powder coated because it's looking pretty rough. I did find somebody who's rebuilding a Mark V to take the engine and some of the other parts that I'm not gonna use. I had to go out of my way to find somebody who will use them because last time I threw away old car parts, Jay Leno yelled at me. You didn't throw them away. Uh, I did. You never throw anything away. You're like actually, my wife, you don't throw stuff away. I'm not sure how I'm gonna get the body off of the frame, especially in this short garage. 
On my Honda, I just put anchors in the ceiling and ratchet strap the body off the frame. That body was only a few hundred pounds, and as we've already discussed, everything on this car is twice as heavy as it looks, and this body looks pretty heavy. If it's too heavy, then the ceiling caves in and my living room couch will be here. So tune in next week for that. What will I build next? I don't know. I do know, actually, it's right in there. But if you want to find out, hit that subscribe button and follow along. Be sure to like and share and all that other stuff, and I'll see you next time.